Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Job, chapter 39, verses 13 through 30. This is a continuation of the scripture passage that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. This is God's speech to Job in the middle of the whirlwind near the end of the book of Job. If you want to follow along, you can find it in page 486 of your pew Bibles in the Old Testament section. And of course, if you have your own Bible, you can simply look up Job 39, verses 13 through 30. The book of Job is right before the book of Psalms, almost right at the center of most Bibles. Let us read the scripture together. The ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage, for it leaves its eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. It deals cruelly with its young as if they were not its own. Though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear, because God has made it forget wisdom and given it no share in understanding. When it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and rider. Do you give the horse its might? Do you clothe its neck with mane? Do you make it leap like the locust? Its majestic snorting is terrible. It paws violently, exults mightily. It goes out to meet the weapons. It laughs at fear and is not dismayed. It does not turn back from the sword. Upon it rattle the quiver, the flashing spear and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, it swallows the ground. It cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, it says, Aha! From a distance it smells the battle, the thunder of the captains, and the shouting. Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? It lives on the rock and makes its home in the fastness of the rocky crag. From there, it spies the prey. Its eyes see it from far away. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some churches and preachers would have you believe that the Bible is really just a simple, straightforward text. All you have to do is read what it says, do it, and that's it. But for anyone who actually reads the Bible and studies the Bible to any extent, it doesn't take long to realize that things are not quite that simple. Take our scripture passage today, beginning in verse 13. Now, I'm going to read you this one verse, verse 13, in several of the most well-respected and well-known English translations of the Bible, and I want you to listen and see what differences you can pick out. We'll start with the NRSV, that's what your blue pew Bibles are. This is the Bible most commonly used in the Presbyterian Church. It's a fairly modern translation and a very scholarly one as well. So the NRSV translates verse 13 as, the ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage. All right, here's the NIV. This is the New International Version. This is a favorite Bible in a lot of Baptist or Evangelical churches, also a fairly modern translation. And it says, The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and the feathers of the stork. Wait a minute. Now there's a stork in here along with the ostrich. That wasn't in the NRSV. Let's look to the ESV, the English Standard Version. This is probably the most recent scholarly translation of the Bible that came out in 2001. The ESV says, The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions 
and plumage of love. Okay, hold on a minute. There was no stork in this one. There was an ostrich, but where did the love come in? That wasn't in the other two. All right, maybe you're a traditionalist, so let's go to the King James Version. This is arguably the most famous translation of the Bible of the last five centuries. The King James Version says, Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich. And there's nothing about love in this one, but now we have a peacock along with the stork and the ostrich, but whether but the stork was at the end and the peacock was kind of in the beginning. Okay, let's go even back further to the Septuagint translation. This is older than the King James. It was actually a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and this is an English translation of that Greek. And the Septuagint says, the peacock has a beautiful wing. If the stork and the ostrich conceive, it is worthy of notice. And now we have storks, ostriches, and peacocks all in the same verse, possibly conceiving, and we're still not a lot closer to understanding what this verse is even talking about. What a mess. Well, if you happen to have one of our blue pew Bibles handy, the NRSV translation, I want you to do something for me. Remember, we are in Job chapter 39, right? Yep, Job chapter 39, verse 13. You can find that on page 486. And on page 486, I want you to look for something for me. I want you to look at the footnote that's right there for verse 13. I think it's the letter N somewhere in that verse. If you're not looking at the NRSV, if you're looking at any good study Bible with footnotes, there should be some kind of a footnote to explain why all the different translations are so different here. What does that footnote that you found at the bottom of the page say for verse 13? You're going to have to speak up loud so I can hear you. Meaning of H-E-B, that's short for Hebrew, meaning of Hebrew, uncertain. Now, I want you to look just a few verses down at verse 18, because there's a footnote to that one too. It's probably the same footnote, right? Same letter. What does it say? Again, meaning of Hebrew, uncertain. Now, I want you to flip backwards, because remember, we're at the end of the book of Job. Just flip to any page in the book of Job. And look at the footnotes at the bottom. And see if you find that same footnote. You'll find it almost on every single page of the book of Job. And remember that it's not just once on every couple of pages. Sometimes the footnote is used the same, it's the same footnote, but they use it multiple times throughout the page. Meaning of Hebrew, uncertain. I think you can find that about a hundred times or more in the book of Job, and I'm not exaggerating. Now, it is absolutely true that the book of Job contains some of the most difficult and challenging Hebrew in the entire Old Testament. But this is also a good reminder to us that if even the world's foremost experts and biblical scholars and translators in every generation, going back for more than a thousand years, still can't agree or even figure out what so many Bible verses mean, then maybe, just maybe, we should approach this book with a little bit of humility and wonder rather than certainty and overconfident judgment about what it says, as unfortunately many Christians today do. But nor should we be too quick to dismiss this book on the basis of our limited understanding of it or on the basis of someone's translation of it, as unfortunately many non-Christians do today. Yes, the Bible contains much wisdom, things worth knowing and worth practicing, but the Bible also contains much mystery, things worth studying, things worth pondering, things worth struggling with or simply soaking in, even when they don't seem to make any sense just yet or ever. Getting back to our uh, ostrich slash stork slash peacock. For the purposes of this sermon, 
I'm going to assume, along with the NRSV translation, that what we're actually talking about here is, in fact, an ostrich, at least in verses 13 through 18. Now, for the past two weeks, we have been looking at these lists of animals that show up in the book of Job. And just like the ancient wisdom sages who wrote the book of Job, we are asking ourselves what wisdom we can learn from the natural world around us, in particular from the animals that God created and that God references in this speech to Job. All right, today's list, minus peacocks and storks, includes the ostrich, the horse, the eagle, and the hawk. And we are supposed to ask, like the ancient wisdom sages did, what do all of these animals have in common? Think about that. Now, last week's list included a bunch of wild animals. And so it might be tempting to see this as just a continuation of the verses that came right before it. And that could work, except for the horse stuck smack in the middle of this passage, which is one of the oldest domestic domesticated animals in any civilization. Yes, there is such a thing as a wild horse, but if you paid attention in the scripture reading, the horse described in this passage is a war horse used by humans for human purposes. It is clearly a domesticated animal. And actually, all of the animals in this list were domesticated in the ancient world. There is evidence of ostrich farming and even humans riding on ostriches as far back as ancient Samaria, 1,000 years before the time of Christ. And both eagles and hawks were domesticated and used as hunting animals in ancient Egypt and ancient Babylon. So I don't think these are all wild animals. Besides that, last week's list, which had the wild ox and the wild donkey, specified that these were wild and not the domesticated counterparts of the animals. So what do they have in common? Ostrich, horse, hawk, and eagle. Well, three of those animals, you may have noticed, are birds. But once again, the horse is right in the middle of that passage. You can't add it to the one after it or put it to the one before. So it's not that. Two of the animals, both the horse and the ostrich, are land runners, while two of them, the hawk and the eagle, are sky flyers. One early guess that I had when I was studying this passage is that these animals are all known for their speed, their swiftness in some way or another. But looking at it a little bit more closely, I think there's another thing that ties them all together, at least in the way that they are described in this passage, and that is their connection with acts of violence, with apparent or perceived cruelty. The ostrich in verse 6 is actually described as dealing cruelly with its young, as if they were not its own. And I can understand how an observant student of ostriches in the ancient world might have come to that conclusion. You see, a male ostrich will mate with several females, but the dominant female will push all of the other female eggs out of the nest, leaving them to be trampled or ransacked by predators. And if you just happened upon an ostrich nest, it would look as though there were a ton of eggs just haphazardly pushed outside of the nest if you, didn't, if you weren't able, like the mother is, to tell the difference between your eggs and all of the other eggs. Now, the modern student of ostriches might also note that even those ousted eggs serve a very practical and useful function. They serve as an early source of nutrition for the few eggs that actually hatch. Now, that may not sound that pleasant or appealing to us, but I'm sure it's appreciated by the lone survivor of the nest. You see, less than Less than 1% of all the eggs in an ostrich nest, and there are a lot of eggs, less than 1% actually go on to become full-grown ostriches. Next we have a horse. The horse is described in verses 19 through 25 with its terrible snorting, its violent pawing, and its fierceness and even rage. A 
Clearly, this is not a gentle farm horse or a prancing show horse. This is the mighty war horse that goes out to meet the weapons and laughs at fear when it smells the battle ahead of it. Finally, we have the eagle and the hawk described in verses 26 through 30. These are rapacious birds of prey living on barren crags and spying out their food from a distance. Its young ones suck up blood, says the Bible, and where the slain are, in other words, the dead or wounded in battle, there it is, this bird of prey. Now, this is all some pretty violent, gruesome imagery. When people behave this way towards one another, we tend to judge and condemn and even punish such actions, and yet, Nobody ever thinks that we should blame or punish the ostrich, the horse, the eagle, or the hawk for acts of violence that they may do as part of their life in the wild and in nature, or even domesticated. Is that because we, as human beings, are so much better, so much smarter, so much more enlightened than these animals? Well, I don't think so. But nor do I think that God, or the writer of the book of Job, is condoning violence here in this passage. I think this is simply an acknowledgement that we live in a world where violence happens for any number of reasons, some pragmatic and some truly random. And violence can tear apart lives swiftly in the twinkling of an eye, as fast as, well, an eagle or an ostrich. But remember that God in this chapter is talking to Job. Job, who has lost everything at the hands of violent bandits who raided his property, and also at the hand of violent windstorms that took the lives of his children. If we are truly observant students of life, then we too must acknowledge that we do live still today in a world filled with violence. Sometimes that is perpetrated by our fellow human beings, but just as often that violence comes from natural disasters and cataclysms, or what insurance companies like to call acts of God. This has been true for thousands of years. And despite all our best efforts, despite all the progress we've made with humanity and civilization and precautions and technology, I still think that violence will be with us as part of this world for thousands of years to come. We don't have to love that. We don't have to work towards it. In fact, we work against it. We don't have to condone it. But we do have to respond to it when it happens. And wisdom teaches us that we have a choice. We can fall into despair over the apparent cruelty of life in this world. And Job almost does exactly that for several chapters before God shows up to snap him out of it. The alternative is we can also humbly acknowledge our small, and fragile place in a much bigger world. We can walk with each other through those times of violence and appreciate the times that we have in between. We can help each other and encourage each other in the face of that violence. And we can remember God's sovereign control over all the things that we do not and cannot understand. It's worth remembering that that lone ostrich egg that hatches and survives into adulthood, even despite all of the cruelty to the other eggs that never made it, that lone egg can live for almost 60 years, the longest lifespan of almost any bird. And as verse 18 points out, when that ostrich spreads its flightless wings, it puts both horse and the rider to shame. It's also worth remembering that the mighty war horse described in this passage did not cause the war, and 
doesn't really care much about all of the things that human beings fight over, but when that horse rides into battle, it laughs at fear and is not dismayed. And what would some of us give for that kind of self-confidence, that kind of calm and control in the face of danger, in the face of stress in this world? It is worth remembering that the eagle and the hawk do not take any sides in the struggles and divisions of men. But they watch, and they wait, and they feed their young ones, and that is something we could see to be a good thing, even if we may have a little bit of distaste for the method in which it's done, they and the occasion on which it's done, but they watch, and they wait, and they feed their young ones with exactly what God has provided. So people of First Presbyterian Church, Will you listen to the animals? Will you let yourself be taught by these animals, even some of the hard and difficult lessons of life? Will you seek after the wonder and the mystery of God's creation? And will you let yourselves be caught up, swept up in the beautiful, terrible, amazing, dangerous, and wonderful existence that God has created and that God calls us into. About 11 years ago, when I was studying the book of Job in seminary and reflecting on this passage, God speaking to Job from out of the whirlwind, somewhere in the midst of that, my brother-in-law, Mark Jennings, um, lost his life. He was out pruning a tree in his front yard one day, and a car with someone who had been on some kind of medication ran off the road, struck him, and killed him instantly, also killing the driver of the car. It was such a random and unpredictable kind of thing. He had married my sister only just one year prior to that, and we were all devastated. And I looked to the Bible for wisdom, for answers, and the question, where were you, God, in all of this, kept coming to my mind. And then when I read the book of Job in chapter 39, God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, when I created all of these things, some of them terrible, some of them amazing? Where were you? And that question goes both ways. So, in thinking of all of those things and in processing all of that, I wrote a song called Where Were You? based on the speech of God in Job chapter 38 and 39. It's also worth pointing out that we found out not too long after Mark died that my sister was pregnant with my niece and became one of my son, youngest son Jonah's best buddies in the world. And so even there, there is beauty and wonder and amazement that can come out of the most tragic circumstances. And yet we still have no way to understand why or when or how these things happen. When I wrote this song, Where Were You? All of my children could barely even hold instruments, let alone play them. Um, and yet now they certainly can do that. And so we're gonna, the Locke family is gonna play a song for you today. This is a song that begins, it begins with God's voice, but it ends with our voice. And so what I invite you to do as that takes, the song makes the shift, is to let this be your prayer this morning, even in the midst of all the things that we cannot understand or fathom. We're related, so.